Welcome everybody. My name is Jody Schneiderman and I work at the College for Education Center and I am a health science and tech industry advisor. I'll be moderating this career panel today. I'm really excited to have um, four and hopefully our fifth panelists for global public health careers will come on. Really the goal of this talk is to help you get an idea of the different kind of global health careers out there what that looks like, what does the day-to-day -day look like, and get some advice from these accomplished alumni. So we're gonna go ahead and get started um, with Zaina. If you wouldn't just mind sharing your career journey with us, and we'll have each of the panelists do that. Zaina, if you could get started. Perfect, so first of all, thank you everybody for attending, and thank you for inviting me to share my career journey. Um, I am Zaina Abul Hawa, and I'm a graduate of the Masters of Science in Global Health, class of 2019. Uh, I conducted my uh, internship in uh, Hyderabad, India, where I interned at the National Institute of Nutrition. And after I came back, I was grateful to actually have immediate employment at Henry M. Jackson Foundation, where I conducted research, uh, more like a public health job uh, on total force fitness. Uh, I was a government contractor. And afterwards, when the pandemic hit, thankfully, I was able to actually uh, gain uh, uh, ORI's uh, fellow position, which is the Oak Ridge Institute of Science and uh, Education. And I was assigned to the uh, uni sorry, uniform, <laughs> United States Southern Command. And at US Southcom, I'm, I'm currently assistant chief and public health uh, and preventive medicine analyst. Uh, at Southcom, we work on syn synchronizing health engagements between our partner nations. We actually have 31 partner nations in Latin America and the Caribbean. And my role currently is basically investigating the emergence of the pandemic and basically, as I mentioned, synchronizing health engagements to actually improve uh, health out outcomes in, their, um, in Latin America and uh, the Caribbean. So as, as part of like investigating the uh, emergence of COVID-19, we actually work on tracking uh, vaccine donations. Uh, we actually uh, respond to, uh, for example, if they have a burden on hospitals and all that, that's all our uh, responsibility. But uh, that's not only my task. I also conduct uh, research on entomological uh, surveillance and uh, specifically also other stuff such as, for example, responding uh, to disaster to this, to such as like um, hurricanes, especially like this year, we had actually two in our AOR area of responsibility. We had the Ayora and the uh, Era um, hurricanes. So that was part of our, uh, our you know, like uh, position, our work. So we also work a lot on, as I mentioned, COVID-19. So we support, uh, you know, like local, local level, like in Miami, but also we support the maintenance and management and also training of like the COVID-19 uh, rapid response team and, you know, like establishing protocols for the contract tracing, uh, uh, if, you know, like uh, a position like in, in Southcom and also at our 31 countries. So my day-to-day -day role is very different. Like if every day I have different stuff. However, it's mainly, you know, like uh, looking for opportunities to actually uh, uh, develop uh, global health projects, such as, for example, currently our biggest project is something called VIMS uh, slash Sages, which is in partnership with uh, John Hopkins University, where we're actually developing a biosurveillance uh, uh, the tool or like a system where we are uh, basically developing the system to connect uh, Costa Rica, Colombia and Panama. So for example, if something was to happen like this one, like the like the pandemic or not even pandemic, any, any sharing of health uh, information, these countries or uh, within the ministries of health can share uh, the uh, share, share health data remotely uh, via an M, M health uh, application. So that's currently a project that is approved by the Department of Defense that we're working on. So uh, as part as I know that another question is, uh, what would I have done differently if I oh, was certain them? That's okay, just wait. So right now, I'm just gonna have you all answer, what has been your career journey? And I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna come back to you to get a little bit more into what you do on a day-to-day, -day, if that was a great you know, summary, but even like more specific would be great just to help us understand what that day looks like. But for now, if each panelist wants to just, you know, Austin, if you go next, just share like what your career journey has been. How did you get to where you're at now? Thank you, Zaina. Thank you, Mom. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm Austin Booth. I, I graduated from the SFS in 2018. I, um, my major was STIA, Science, Tech, and International Affairs, and I focused on um, energy and the environment. 
Um, but throughout my time at Georgetown, I had a number of internship opportunities in public health um, consulting agencies in, in Florida, which is where I'm from originally, and, and launched me into that arena. And then post-college, so I graduated in 2018. And then in November of 2018, I started working with RTI International, which is my current job. Um, RTI mostly focuses on um, government grants and awards. Uh, I could talk a little bit about the project work that I've gotten into. I'm not sure if that should wait for the day to day, Jody. Yes, let's wait for the day to day. Thank you, Austin. Okay, I'll keep it brief to that point then. Yeah. Jesse, if you want to go ahead and share your career journey with us, and you have an interesting educational background, so definitely please share that part. Yeah, I also am noting that my graduation year is well um, in the past, so my career journey is, is quite long, so I'll try to give the abbreviated version. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Jesse Patterson. I'm actually a two-time graduate of uh, uh, the School of Nursing and Health Studies at Georgetown. So I graduated in 2006 with, I think I was in the second class of the Global Health um, Program, and so my Global Health um, internship was in Ghana and um, my thesis or my research was focused on malaria related mortality um, in Ghana and so <clears throat> it was fascinating I mean I think while I was there I we did all sorts of field visits and stuff like that I'm sure a lot of you have done sort of similar things but one of the things that really helped me was while I was there I, I, I uh, synced up with uh, the US Embassy and particularly with the U.S. Agency of International Development, USAID. And so they had a field office in Ghana, and I, was present, I presented um, some of my initial research to the health officer um, in Ghana, and she sort of put me in contact with the USAID headquarters back in Washington, knowing that they were starting up what was going to be the President's Malaria Initiative, so it was a global malaria initiative, and that they were obviously uh, hiring. So, you know, I actually essentially got recruited right out of my international health program um, and started working for USAID um, uh, as soon as I got back in 2007. Um, and so I stayed with USAID for about three years. Again, that's on the, the government side. So they do a lot of the contracting with like RTIs and, and stuff. Um, but uh, so I worked with USAID for about three years and then made a decision to go back to, to, to Georgetown to get a nursing degree, um, mostly because I realized that, you know, a lot of people from public health who work in the public health arena um, would benefit from sort of getting sort of practical experience. And so having gone to NHS and having a lot of the nursing prerequisites already done, I decided to get a second degree and a bachelor's in nursing. So I did that. Um, uh, it was a, an intense 16 month bachelor's degree. And with that came an obligation that I would work domestically at a hospital. So I worked at Washington Hospital Center here in, in DC, mostly in the emergency department. Um, while I was doing that, uh, the hospital that I was working at, Washington Hospital Center actually had a, um, a tuition assistance program. So they would, they gave you, I think, $10,000 a year for graduate education. So I went back and got my master's while I was nursing, when I was doing nursing, um, in health and medical policy with a certificate in global medical policy. Um, and then when I achieved that, I, um, I realizing that I didn't want to do nursing for my entire life. I just kind of wanted to get that sort of hands-on clinical experience to inform the larger policy decisions that I would be making, making later on in life. I um, applied to any and every health job I could look at from the government side. So I ended up going to the State Department and they have a global HIV AIDS office. So I worked on the global HIV AIDS office. I was covering mostly um, Central or Southeast Asia for about a year. Then I um, transitioned back to USAID, um, working in the Africa Bureau, covering um, Sudan and South Sudan. Um, as a USAID employee, I was actually uh, eligible for some of their free education. So I actually got another master's in national security policy. Um, and then sort of like, you know, I worked in covering South, South Sudan and Sudan for a while, transitioned, covered um, Latin America for a while. So Brazil, some of our environmental programs there in Peru. And then um, 
my most recent job, I, I transferred um, to USAID's Office of HIV and AIDS. And currently I uh, cover key populations. So um, that's MSM, men who have sex with men, female sex workers, people who inject drugs um, and prisoners. So our HIV programs specifically in, for those populations in Uganda, Central America and um, the Caribbean. Um, again, my journey is kind of long and all over the place. I promise you there was like some vision that guided me through this the whole time, but I'm happy where I am right now and I can answer, I guess, more of those other questions later on. Do you want to quickly share that vision? Oh, so <laughs> yeah, I think the whole sort of idea was that throughout the whole experience, I wanted, I knew I wanted to focus on global health. And while I sort of looked for opportunities in global health, I kept my, my eyes open for other things that could be, you know, beneficial or interesting and could later kind of like uh, put me in a position where I'd be better, best place to, to, um, uh, to inform like global health policy. And so while people are, while you might ask like, oh, well, why did you go to, you know, work um, cover, you know, South Sudan, which at the time or Sudan at the time we didn't have health programs. But that sort of, there were some interesting nuggets that I sort of picked up from that, from looking at like humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and stuff like that, that later on kind of helped me sort of um, uh, think about health in a different way. Like, how do you deliver healthcare in an emergency setting? How do you deliver healthcare when you don't have sort of the, the, the normal structures that you would think about? And so like all of these sort of interesting nuggets sort of, I think, you know, positioned me in a way that when, um, for instance, COVID hit and our agency had to figure out who had a, a, like a very diverse set of experiences, I got tapped to be the director of health and, and occupational safety because I had the infectious disease experience, I had the nursing experience, I had the national security experience, I had, you know, experience working in Latin America, South, you know, Africa, Southeast Asia. So they were like, hey, this guy sort of knows a, lot, a little bit about a lot of things, right? And so I think that part of that journey is sort of looking at sort of those broad opportunities. And even if it's not sort of directly related to global health, understanding that at some point, you know, those experiences that might seem sort of tended to, like outside that experience um, will help you um, if you sort of shape it in the right way. So it's just kind of like, you know, having that sort of core the whole time through. So the whole time I was doing nursing, the whole time I was focusing on global health, but also not like eliminating positions or opportunities that are sort of outside that lane, because I think it, it sort of helps build your portfolio um, over time. Thank you. I think it's really helpful to hear. I think, you know, I see a lot of students that want to have their exact path, you know, figured out. And I'm going to guess that most of you, you know, all four of you probably didn't have it, you know, all figured out. And, and you just kept providing new, you know, getting new skill sets, new experiences and seeing where that would lead you. And one never knows. So it's a great example of that. Thank you, Jesse. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I would love to hear about your career journey. Yeah, thanks. And Jesse, this is a hard one to follow. I feel like you have such a storied career, so the pressure is on. Um, it's funny that you use the word journey because I think that connotes like an order to this process that for me has been, has not felt very organized and at times like has been panicky. Um, but as you look back, it has a way of everything just fitting together in a neat bow. So um, if you are currently panicking about your career, don't worry, it's very normal. Um, I was a biology of global health major, um, class of 2014. I entered college thinking I wanted to go to medical school and went through the full uh, prerequisites of medical school. And then I kind of had a eureka moment when I I was late night working in a biochem lab at the medical school thinking, I hate this um, and I am not enjoying my life. Um, and in that moment, I literally went downstairs and applied to study abroad. Um, and I applied to study abroad in Botswana because they have a very good public health program. 
And I had always been interested in public health, sort of a, a tangential field to medicine. Um, and I'm so glad that I made that choice. Uh, while I was there, there was a lot of, um, part of the curriculum is that you visited clinics and you sort of observed how, um, how programs were established. I learned about maternal health. I learned about HIV AIDS programs. Um, I learned how adolescent health works and doesn't work. Um, I was very young, so it's not as though at the time I all of these lessons were sinking in, but it's definitely an experience that I can turn to time and again for the good and bad. I also saw how medical doctors spoke to their patients and the sort of power dynamics behind that that I was not expecting at the time. Um, and I really came back from that experience just completely enamored with the idea of working in public health. It just had such a great intersection of things that I enjoyed um, while I was in school, anthropology, ethics, medicine, science, technology, diplomacy. Um, and I just didn't really know what to do with that because I had had a very science focused career school wise um, up to that point. Um, but I, so my senior year, I, I asked a lot of questions. I went to my professors and, and tried to use my Georgetown network. Eventually someone connected me with someone who connected me with someone. And I ended up working at a small um, medical supplies company in, in Pittsburgh. They donated non-used medical supplies to clinics in South America. And I was enjoying that experience, but at the time, like knew that it wasn't what I wanted to do. Um, and so I applied to like every job I could find an opportunity and I applied to the UN just thinking like, what the heck? Um, and somehow I got a call back and I moved to New York and started working within the medical unit at the UN Secretariat. And this is 2014, right at the beginning of the Ebola um, epidemic. And so when I joined, what started as an internship became a, a full position. Um, and I think a lesson that I learned from that job is essentially I didn't have like a clear responsibility, but I had some skills from school, from working in a lab, and I knew how to use data. Um, and while I was there, I realized that, so I worked in a, in a clinic, the UN has its own medical team and, and it provides support to any staff the folks who were coming to us before they were going to West Africa weren't following protocol in terms of like public safety. And so they were traveling without getting checkups. Um, and so while I was there, I kind of uncovered this disaster that could have happened. Um, and so they, because of that, I got a job, a full-time job and um, started doing some programs and protocols to support UN staff um, across UNICEF, WHO, uh, and the United Nations to make sure that there was public, self, pu public health safety nets before people could travel to and from West Africa. Um, and that was a very cool experience, but it was too early in my career to really be at a big agency like that. There's not a lot of young people who work at the UN and it's typically a place where people go at the very end of their career when you know they have a lot of experience. It's not a fast paced place, even during an emergency setting. And I knew I wasn't really learning um, good skill, like good work ethic and skills. And so I really, I, I really enjoyed the experience while I was there. I knew I was lucky to have a job at the UN. It sounded like very sexy, but I knew I needed to go elsewhere. So. I started applying to jobs and I really enjoyed living in New York. Um, and I applied to where I work now. Uh, it's Global Health Strategies. We're a strategic communications and advocacy firm that works solely in the global health space. It's very, very niche. Um, and I didn't really know anything about communications when I joined here, but I knew from my experience in the UN that if you don't have good communications, you can have really great programs, but nothing is going to happen because nobody knows about them. Um, and so I applied with 
just like a can-do attitude and a real interest in this space. And, and somehow I got the job and I started as an associate very early on in my career and was working mainly on immunizations um, and trying to specifically convince governments to invest in immunizations um, to support development and trying to showcase the links of immunizations brings this amount in educational attainment, X amount in um, economic power, trying to showcase the value add of immunizations. Um, during my time here, I've worked on a number of different public health issues. Um, this is a very siloed space where even when Jesse was talking about it, he's like, and I was humanitarian section and before I was in HIV AIDS and it's a, it's a problem that it persists in, in the space because everybody's so uh, segmented, but I've worked on um, malaria, maternal health, um, and now I'm sort of coming full circle and um, also working on the pandemic. Um, I do a lot of COVID communication supporting organizations, uh, particularly the Pan American Health Organization and um, their messaging, how they're talking about the pandemic and their, their plans. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, Zaina, you listed off quite a lot of stuff that your team does. Would love to hear specifically, and you mentioned a few things that you've done, but would you be willing to share, maybe even you take one, one example, you mentioned I think COVID, like what your, what your role entails, so give a sample project and, and walk us through what, what you do. Cool, perfect. So as an assistant chief of global health, Engage, first of all, thank you guys for, for all of you for presenting because like really I'm also impressed from everybody so that's amazing so basically as an assistant chief of global health engagement um uh, my day to day work as I mentioned differs like each day uh but currently we don't really work because our our our, our focus is on COVID in the partner nations and uh we are always like basically working with our partner nations uh like for example today uh we had to for example look at uh we got vaccines from the state department and we're in contact with uh, uh the ministries uh, uh ministries of health and of course our U.S. embassies uh in our AUR to see and prioritize like which uh, of our 31 partner nations, uh, we should actually uh, donate for and help first. Uh, and it's all about not only about burden of COVID, but also about like uh, vaccine diplomacy and, you know, like which partner nation is, you know, like at most uh, um, our friends and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, so this is one thing that we're doing. Another thing, as I mentioned, is the VIMS project, which is a partnership with Johns Hopkins University. And this is our focus now because after the pandemic, we realized that uh, one of the things that our AUR in uh, our area of responsibility in Latin America and Caribbean is missing is basically regional uh, information sharing uh, because of the lack of ability for uh, ministries of health and defense and also agriculture agriculture to share health information um, uh, really quickly and rapidly uh, this could have contributed to the you know like spread of the pandemic and so on specifically like now with the uh, raise in, in the variants so uh, that VIMS project will enable as I mentioned uh, the ministries uh, of health and even like uh, like hospitals in 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 uh, Costa Rica Colombia and Panama to share the information with each other and uh, will basically help us to you know like better uh, inform health policies if needed so that's part of my job and also uh, along with that we're actually uh, organizing uh, the global health security of america's conference which is basically bringing in all of the um, partner nations along with our interagency partners uh, in the united states to actually uh, you know talk about what are our step stepping stones and moving Moving forward to actually uh, address infectious disease uh, surveillance and biosecurity in, in the region. Perfect. Thank you so much. Austin. Sure. So I, I think I, I'm going to describe my day to day, perhaps pre COVID, and then what it looks like today, because those look a bit different. But um, March of last year, I was living in DC. I was working in the Rockville office for RTI. Our, our main headquarters is in um, Raleigh. So 
and the reason I bring that up is because I, I was quite lucky in the sense of working in a regional office is a lot like working remotely in the sense that a lot of your meetings are held in Zoom spaces. And so it was a pretty uh, not as awkward transition as it might have been for other people. But one of the big projects that I worked on just to sort of echo a lot of the type of work that people are describing here um, would be, um, since I'm a, I'm a French speaker, so uh, a lot of West Africa oriented projects were, were in my portfolio. So for example, up until um, the pandemic, I was maybe once a season going to spend two weeks or so in, uh, I think last time I was in Gabon, but I went to Guinea, I went to Senegal, I think I'm forgetting one, but um, yeah, give me, yeah, that's those are the three for now. But um, what I would do there is um, work on a, a DOD funded HIV AIDS project, which partnered with um, local militaries to assess their military's um, behavioral uh, risk factors for HIV AIDS, as well as baseline HIV AIDS prevalence within the military, because they people have found that you know, in, in these corpuses that travel around a lot, they interact with more people, they're more likely to contract um, AIDS. And, and it was a really interesting and fulfilling project to work on. I got started and I wanted to talk about what a lot of people have said, which is the spontaneity in which your career becomes something. It was, I, I came in at an entry level position. Um, we had this HIV AIDS project in, um, Gabon. Uh, we had a number of people working on it, and they all had to be in Sydney for a meeting to present on this project at the same time that we were helping close out the project. And so they tapped me because I had worked a little bit on it, and I was a French speaker, and they said, you're going to go by yourself and spend two weeks there. And it was terrifying. And luckily, at the very end, one person was able to join me and help me along in it. But I also realized I really thrived in those kinds of environments where I didn't necessarily know everything that was going on. I was thrown into a new environment. I could spend two weeks every three months doing something different. And so I wanted to speak a little bit about when you're thinking about your career now, I apologize, there's someone blowing off the porch right next to me. Um, but uh, I realized that something that I could have been thinking about when I was still at Georgetown was how do I work? Because I, I think I could give advice on what to study, but we're all here for global health, so that's kind of moot. But how do I work and how can I translate that into my work life? So do I work best by myself? Do I work best in small groups? Do I work best in large groups? I work very poorly in large groups because no one wants to do anything because everyone thinks it's everyone else's job. In small groups of two or three, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. That's going to be different for everyone. Also, what what is your personal life uh, entail, and, and how important is that to you? Do you? Some people really do want to spend ten hours a day at work. Some people are trying to build a family. You can't go away for three weeks every couple months. Um, so that that was something that I learned and I didn't realize about myself until it, it came at me. But to think about it now and how you're going through your education now and what feels good and what feels bad, I think will serve you in the future. The other side of the projects that I got to develop is again, a, a door closes and another opens. Since COVID started, obviously we're not traveling and <laughs> we were gonna do an HIV AIDS, a similar type project in Mali, but combined with COVID and then they had a, a coup d'etat that kind of cut that one off. But um, I started working a bit more in depth on um, an opioids project funded through the NIH. Um, and I had the time and I've gotten to really become involved in addiction research, which I've loved. And I didn't think that that was necessarily something that was going to go beyond a couple classes that I took at the time at Georgetown, but having that inkling was enough to say yes to being tapped to go on to this project, which was enough to spark my interest and build a path out that way. And so I think working really intuitively with yourself is probably the most successful way to go about this than I don't know, I was kind of thinking 
some cheesy line that I had heard once when I was probably going to the career center was like, it's a lot like driving at night. You just, you need to see what's in your headlights in order to move forward, but you don't need to know the full extent, but it's true. It's like, you have the context of what's happening right now in front of you. And you can start with that to take the next step. And then that step will inform, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, and then I do just want to point out that I, a couple people had mentioned Ebola projects and I got the chance to work on that with the CDC over the past few years in Guinea and doing um, global health surveillance, building up surveillance systems in low resource settings um, in Guinea and Gabon and right now in the DRC and in Nigeria. Um, and I think my final point was that so much of what I've learned on in, in this career path so far has had very little to do with the fundamentals that I necessarily learned in school. I didn't think I was ever going to have an active interest in project management. It just didn't seem like something that I was prepared to learn about coming from school. It's not something that's discussed a lot. And yet in my day-to-day -day life, that's what matters is how do you organize a project around this public health interest? How do you divide tasks around this public health interest? Which will really, and I, and I keep saying that because it's something that you can take into any sort of setting. Um, so that even if I were to leave public health, I could say, I know how to divide up a project. I know how to you know, use these skills that I took and apply it to the next thing. Um, I'll stop there for, for now. That's great. I love yeah. my fellow board. I love project management. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. We just moved over to teams, so uh, we can we can fight about that. But um, and one quick question: you were mentioning work-life balance, and you know that's yeah. good questioning. Like, what do you want? I'm just curious with RTI. So, are you saying that you have a pretty good work-life balance there, or do you work a lot of hours? Yeah, I, I do have a pretty good work-life balance. Um, I was lucky enough to, you know, move and and, and become a temporary telecommuter, but then a permanent one. And that was a choice that I was able to make because my company, you know, trusted me to be able to do so. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a very nice balance for me. I don't know if I could be the private sector uh, consulting type. It's, I just don't have it in me. I get, I get tired quick, but um, I'm happy to have found a place that accommodates uh, how I naturally work. And I wasn't always there, but especially with my current portfolio of work, it became important to me to bring my best and that involved understanding when, where, and how to produce that. Great. Sounds like you might like the UN one day, right, Andrew? <laughs> I'm not going to say I have to have to move uh, slowly because I, as I said, I, I did enjoy, you know, some of the breakneck aspects, but in doses was nice, you know. Yes. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just thinking. Okay. So Jesse, we'd love to hear about your day-to-day, -day. tell us about, you know, a project that you're working on and what that looks like and the skill set you're using. Yeah, so um, just to remind folks, right now I am the Senior Clinical Advisor um, for Key Populations, um, and I focus on Uganda, Central America, and the Caribbean. And so, <clears throat> I guess, you know, day in life, there's, uh, for working for the government, you just have a lot of meetings and a lot of those meetings don't always like come uh, uh, lead to tasks, but um, I guess over the past two days, so um, Uganda is, I don't know, six or eight hours ahead or something like that. But uh, anyway, so we, um, so this morning at like seven, I had a call with my co counterpart who works in the Uganda, uh, USA mission in Uganda, and he is the key populations advisor. And so we had a call because every four, every um, every three months, um, all of our partners who we provide funding to put all of their results into a database, and so um, we have an opportunity to review the results of our programs based off the targets they they had planned to achieve or what they had planned to achieve. And so for key populations, it's you know how many people are getting tested, how many of those percentages of the tests are positive how many people are linked to care and treatment for HIV. And so um, a lot of that this morning was about an hour looking through um, 
various graphics that we put together via Tableau to see kind of assess partner performance. And really my role is to not sort of like criticize partners or criticize contractors for their performance, but understand where we could be addressing issues um, that are specific to key populations. Um, so, you know, if, if we're seeing that, you know, some female sex workers were, we had a huge increase in female sex workers testing for HIV like two quarters ago, and right now we're seeing a lull, like wh why is that? What's, what's the re rationale behind that? Is that sort of like, is there like an administrative issue or something like that? So it's just looking through um, the various um, uh, indicators that the partners report on and figuring out kind of how do we make uh, course corrections to make sure that we're maximizing the, you know, essentially the U.S. taxpayer dollars um, that's provided through the U.S. government. So that was my Uganda call. And then I had a similar call with Central America. So um, we have programs in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Panama, and a couple other, I think one or two more. But anyway, so a similar call where we just went through the data to figure out kind of what, how is our program performing? Where are the opportunities to really improve our outreach to um, uh, provide better care to people living with HIV um, in Central America. And then um, I had sort of like a, a weird offshoot. So again, everybody is sort of working on COVID right now. And so um, I was uh, temporarily under the previous administration uh, tapped to be the director of occupational health and safety for USAID. And so what that meant was me sort of informing um, the USAID administrator, you know, when we're conditioned safe enough for staff to return to our six offices domestically, right? And so through that position, they still sort of tap me occasionally on some of the COVID related stuff. And so I'm sure some of you saw that um, the Biden administration passed a, a very large uh, COVID relief bill. And some of that will be funding for uh, vaccine uh, distribution overseas and stuff like that. And so um, I had a call um, this morning to talk a little bit about um, some of those activities and particularly how we start to design a strategy for vaccinating our staff domestically. And so, you know, kind of how we go through the procedure, you know, how do we pull in staff to do that, to administer the vaccines? What type of system do we use to record the vaccinations? How, whether or not we make it compulsory for staff to get vaccinated or not. I mean, a lot of, you'd be surprised, but a lot of people who work in global health space don't believe in vaccines. And so you have to sort of give them the option. And so there's all these like sort of interesting lanes that, you know, again, I'm sort of drawing on all sorts of aspects of my background that have really helped me to get to where I am today. Um, then I had a call with, <laughs> Um, on a separate note, kind of on the heels of the previous administration, a lot of um, anti-racism um, efforts sprung up in my agency. And so I'm on the anti-racism task force. And one of the issues that came up sort of in the COVID-19 vaccination space is the um, inequitable distribution of COVID vaccines around the world. You see a lot of Western countries have large access or large stockpiles of vaccines, whereas countries in Africa and Latin America that have been really hit hard with COVID are sort of being um, forced out of the conversation in terms of whether or not they're getting equitable access to, to vaccines. And so we had a meeting to talk a little bit about how we want to, as a sort of small working group, uh, message that to key leaders in the administration in terms of, you know, how we, um, from a diplomatic standpoint, start to address some of the inequities um, and healthcare provision. Um, and then uh, sort of there was a document that I was sent um, last week to help um, sort of provide my input on. And this was, so the, the rest of my afternoon was working on this document. It's, a, it's on our mental health strategy for HIV AIDS. And so within my office, there's a working group on mental health and the impacts of HIV and kind of key considerations we have to, to consider as providers when we're doing um, uh, providing HIV AIDS services. And so um, there's a document kind of outlining sort of best principle, best practices and kind of how we should sort of be informing our global projects to make sure that they incorporate mental health and, and the services that we provide. 
And so I provided some input into that, and that, that'll be part of our larger USAID strategy moving forward. So, I mean, USAID, there's just like so much to sort of step into. Um, uh, you know, global health is, you know, a huge office at USAID, and HIV AIDS is a very, very large office. I think there's like 300, 300 or 400 people in the HIV AIDS office. Um, and so there's all sorts of lanes and niches that you can sort of step into in sort of a technical role or advisory role or just provide feedback on. And so, you know, that's kind of, I, I kind of gave you two days kind of lumped together, but those are the day in the life of Jesse for the past two days. Um, anyway. I'm happy to jump in here. Um, so I work at Global Health Strategies. We're a consulting company that is specifically working in global health. So because we're a consulting company, I have clients. Um, and my clients are global health organizations. Um, so my, my two clients are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and their family planning work and the Pan American Health Organization and their COVID work. Um, so through my support uh, with the Pan American Health Organization, it's kind of my job to write the speech that the director of the Pan American Health Organization gives every week about the COVID situation in the region, what their priorities are, and any key messages that we really need the countries, the media to really push forward. And so there's a whole orchestra of making that happen, but essentially I talk to experts um, to gather what the issues are on the epidemiology side, what are some of the issues on the vaccine uptake side or access side. Um, and then I talk to the director, just get a sense of what she, how she's feeling that week and what, what she wants to talk about. Then I write it down and a lot of people review it. Um, and then we kind of organize this conference every week. Um, and then on my other side, my other client, which is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I work on their family planning, sort of sexual reproductive health and rights work. Um, and they just debuted a new strategy. Um, these are kind of like 10 year, what's their plan for 10 years? And it's, as you can imagine, very complicated and has a lot of steps and little things. And because the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is such a huge contributor to the global health space, they fund a lot of the work. Everyone cares what they have to say and about this. So we hosted a webinar where the director of the family planning team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation presented the strategy to everyone that the Gates Foundation gives money to um, and their partners in the space. And so we helped pull together that presentation, exactly what she was going to say, manage the Q&A portion. Um, my job is really to help the global health actors. I'm kind of like the Illuminati behind the scenes, like helping them figure out what to say, how, what to prioritize, um, and how to say it. Thank you all so very much. Wow, really interesting careers. All of you are doing really wonderful, meaningful work. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Austin, you know, already shared some of his advice, right? Think about your values in terms of teams and work-life balance and, you know, think about project management as a, a skill set. Um, Andrea, you mentioned earlier, you know, don't panic. You know, we never know what's going to happen. I think Jesse was also kind of saying that same message. Uh, but wondering if Zaina and Jesse would want to add anything quick in terms of any quick advice that you would have for students before I am, I'm going to open it up to questions um or or what you would do differently knowing what you know now so i would just want to say that just because for example you conduct uh, your travel abroad or like your practicum somewhere in some area does not mean essentially that this is where you need to stick with because i conducted my uh internship as i mentioned at nin national institute of nutrition in hyderabad uh, yet I'm currently working on infectious diseases. So, and I actually worked even before on like uh, total force fitness. So just because, you know, like you conduct, uh, you conduct your research in an area that's just like my fellow colleagues mentioned, like you don't have to actually stick to this path. It's, it, it's uh, really interesting how, you know, like our degrees can take us essentially everywhere. The options are 
endless. Over. Um, yeah, I would just say, um, specifically with like government agencies, that they're really complicated agencies and you kind of have to do your homework in terms of finding out where the opportunities are. Um, I want to say that like USAID has, um, they, they have like 30 different ways that they hire people. And so you kind of have to do your homework and sort of understand if you want to get your foot in the door, where to look in terms of like where to look to get your foot in the door. The position that I ended up applying to out of Ghana was not posted on the USA website. It was posted on a contractor website, but was to work at USAID. And so, you know, just kind of um, network, reach out, figure out kind of where, how you sort of get your sort of foot in the door, what are the opportunities and kind of how you sort of position yourself to, um, to sort of, uh, to, to apply for, be a, a viable candidate for the position. Like I said, there's just, there's, there's a lot and there, there are ways for, there's, um, there's like new graduate programs that sort of specifically allow the federal government to hire um, new graduates from, um, from certain uh, specialties. And so just, just kind of like do your homework and, and try and make sure that you network and understand where to look for and who to reach out to for specific opportunities. Over. Great. I just, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just I wanted to agree very much with that, and and also I say that it is a small world, the public health, uh, especially in government contracting, and you're going to meet a lot of people that you will see again and again, and so it's really important. I, I think they say that in your whole life, but it, it is the likelihood is much higher that they will come up again in your life than maybe other industries. I couldn't have planned this any better with you two. Um, so there is a question that's, what are some tips for standing out for entry level positions that receive a ton of other applications, right? Like you're, we're all talking about you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and USAID. So, you know, all of these places get a lot of applications. Any other advice, you know, sounds like you're talking about networking and, and just being a part of that community and building relationships. Um, anything else that you would say in terms of standing out? And, I'd say your cover letter is really important. Um, I think there's a lot of people that write very generic cover letters, but I, if you really do your homework on the company and the role and show your interest and in how exactly you, your experiences ladder up to the qualifications that are featured in the job description, that sets you apart. Um, so I think cover letters are, are really important. Yeah, and I would agree. I'm sure everybody would say that, but especially when you're applying to a communications type role or company, those are even going to be more important. Anybody else? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, even if you're not, you know, completely sold on your interview, prepare. I think that that's like one of the biggest things that I've seen in terms of when I've recommended people for positions. Um, is that you can tell when people are sort of have thought through the questions or have like, you know, prepared in advance for the, for the responses. You might not know exactly what you're going to be asked, but if you sort of thought through it and sort of give, you know, really solid responses, you'll impress people. And one of the things that sort of like as, as an anecdote, I was interviewing a, um, a person for um, a uh, mid-level position at USAID and I was on the panel and I was one of the only people that really liked her. Like, I was like, she's amazing, right? Well, um, there was also after she, she didn't get the position that she interviewed with me for, but then I heard about another position in another office. So I recommended her because she was such a strong interviewer and she was so capable and she ended up being hired to that other position. So even if you're not sort of really enthused about the position just make sure that you know through to i think it was austin's point networking you don't know it's a very small world and i'm you might impress somebody who might like feed your resume off to somebody else so just make sure that especially in interviews that you prepare and are sort of put your homework into sort of understanding the organization what their priorities are and what you bring as a an individual that some other people might not bring over 
I mean, I would just yeah. Say, oh, go ahead. Go. No, please, please. Well, I'm actually going to change. I have a question about being introverted because we're hearing about networking and interviewing and and you know, what if you're introverted and what does that look like? So before we get to that, Austin, please share. Yeah, well, this this could potentially tie into that, and and I think part of preparation for interviews that I found a lot of success in is to have it even a cache of like four or five success stories in your own career slash student life that you could work off of. Even if they don't directly apply to a question that you get, if you have four of them, they'll, they will inevitably apply. Or you can say, you know, when did you communicate clearly? Can apply to almost any problem that you overcome in your job or career. And so being able to tease out what someone's looking for from a story that you know well, I think serves you very well in, in interviewing for sure. Um, that, I was gonna add that to, um, to Jesse's point, but I, I think preparing that if you're a more introverted person and, and, and really advocating for yourself. I know I, 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 when, when I am more introverted, I often, I'm the first person to, to leave the conversation and I don't advocate for myself as I should. And, and so, so gaining confidence in your abilities and then practicing communicating them would be a short answer I, to try to maybe artificially tie it into what you were just speaking about. But no, I think that totally makes sense. You know, for introverts, it's hard to think on your feet. So to have some of those stories, and I even recommend, you know, 10 to 20 stories that you're just ready because you'll never guess what question that will be asked. But if you know yourself and you know you have those experiences, you can communicate those. So I, I definitely think that ties into the introversion. Any any other thoughts on that from the other panelists? Andrew? Yeah, I think maybe it's echoing Austin's point. Preparation is really important if you are introverted. And Sure, we don't know the specifics of the questions that they'll ask you in an interview, but you know the contours of those questions. They're going to ask you how you work in teams, how you work alone, how you work under pressure, times you failed, uh, something that you're really proud of. Um, someone might just ask you to tell them a story. So like, think like the interviewer, what would you ask yourself? And then I think you'll feel more comfortable because there's no surprises going into it. You'll you know exactly what um, exactly what you, you can encounter. And do your research on, of course, the interviewers themselves. It might make you feel more comfortable. And also like if you share an alma mater, that, that's something that you can mention. Um, it's sort of an expectation that you know their background going into that interview as well. I think also I just want to mention that, uh, you know, like um, encouraging everybody, of course, to aim for the best, but also to have like realistic expectations, because like many of like, for example, my colleagues expected to, you know, like uh, get out of college and to have like six figure salary. Like, yes, we do make good money, but at the same time, like, you know, like you're not going to get six figures coming straight out of your degree, even if you have a master's degree, you know, so, you know, to have realistic expectations and at the same time to, you know, accept what comes to you like as long as it's something that of course interests you because as my colleagues uh mentioned that you know the, opp the opportunities are endless and you know like you don't have to stick to whatever you start with you know i believe that for example my uh experience working at henry m jackson foundation uh when i first started really like despite the fact that i may not have been you know like uh, my favorite uh you know like my favorite career but uh the opportunity was amazing you know and it's it's also it also benefited me uh and made me develop skills that I'm actually utilizing now at my career at Southcom. That's a great uh, advice, Sina. And you also have a job that you're posting. So thank you for letting everybody know that. Um, yeah, I would also say, you know, to add on that with realistic expectations, like it's okay if it's not Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Like there's lots of non-brand name, um, great organizations that are doing global health too. And, and um, so you can think about those as well. So I do have a one last question. Um, can you please describe any interactions that any of you have had with physicians or residents or medical students in the global public health sectors and ways that um, those individuals can get involved with this work? So um, a lot of my work is involved, is 
involves around advocacy. And so one of the things that we are promoting is universal health, health coverage, the right to health around the world. And so in the past, we have tried to develop sort of champions who could speak out about these issues in local contexts. So in order to make change to sort of our theory that you want to make sure that the people who you want to influence the people who can influence them are also speaking to them. And so doctors are really important as we are trying to create change in global health. So we've engaged them from more of a champion building thing. We help them speak to media. Um, we help give them messages to uh, promote in their communities. We tell their stories. Um, but I think that what I have found, at least in my field, is that when practitioners make a switch to global health, it's a little bit of a, their job sort of changes. It's not about an individual patient. It's much more macro level now. Um, and so we wouldn't engage with a, a practitioner at a local hospital. It's someone who now thinks about malaria. It's someone who now thinks about newborn health, um, who's an expert at an individual issue. And usually folks who are in a leadership position at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at USAID, a lot of them have MDs um, or a nursing background. Yes, I, I agree with everything that Andrea said. And I, I would say <clears throat> the reason why MDs and, and physicians and, and clinicians continue to be an integral part of public health is it should be obvious just by saying that, right? They are the most direct, you know, they are the last step in what is a global health or a public health intervention, right? They, they are gonna be the people administering these. I mean, and so they're going to have a lot of responses and insight on how to like, execute an idea. If you're trying to create, um, you know, community size surveillance uh, for Ebola, something that a couple of us have worked on, it's going to be the physicians that work in those countries that understand best how that might look and where the failures are going to be because people like us who have never worked like that are going to come up with our own assumptions. Um, so the expert knowledge is a huge part of, of clinicians and, and to talk about the domestic side, um, a place where I see a number of clinicians in my work is on um, addiction research. Um, I'm on a, an opioid project with NIH, as I mentioned, um, trying to do interventions in extremely um, affected communities throughout the US. And one of our leads from one of these communities is a, um, a methadone clinic clinician, and he's an MD. And so when we speak to him every week about our intervention, he's the one that tells us, well, that's not really how it happens in the clinic. Or, you know, we're trying to gather data on these and use certain procedure codes. He goes, well, no one actually uses those procedure codes, or people use this and that instead, and they're, they're a highly respected source of knowledge on things that we'll just never naturally have access to. I just want to sort of echo what was said by um, Austin and Andrea. Um, the, a lot, the, so the Global Health Bureau is one of the largest bureaus and offices in USAID, and it's it's mostly staffed by MDs, RNs, and stuff like that. My position actually was originally advertised as an MD-only position, and then um, they didn't like the first round of candidates, so um, they opened it up to nurses. And so I've got my master's in nursing. I'm studying for my NP board, so I was eligible for the position. So it got re-advertised, and I kind of made it in. But um, that sort of, you know, real life kind of clinical background where you have interactions with the patient really helps inform um, some of the policy and programmatic decisions that get made at the global level. And, you know, it, it's re a really good asset to have. So I would sort of advocate in ways that you can. Obviously, I'm, I'm skewed because, but um, I, I recognize that early on in my career, and that's why I actually decided to go back into nursing because I wanted my global health and medical policy to be rooted in something that was, you know, based off personal experience. And so, you know, when I got pulled into the COVID task force, 
for my agency and I was a, a team of 12 people, I was the only one in the room that had ever worked in a hospital. I was the only one that ever touched a patient. I was the only ever one, I was the only one that ever like managed a vent patient, a ventilator patient. And so like that sort of like really niche knowledge is really critical in the room. And so I would say that one of the things that you can really, um, I would advocate for is that if you're in a room and you don't see someone with medical experience that you actually seek that out or try and get that experience yourself. Because I think it's, it, it sort of sets you apart from other people if you do kind of can sort of talk in an informed way about your personal experiences. Um, I, I was sort of arguing at one point when um, my office, USAID was actually trying to reopen and say that, you know, people could, didn't have to wear masks if they were more than six feet apart inside buildings. And I was like, you know, based on my experience working in the hospital and knowing CDC protocols, I'm pretty sure that that's not the case. So like that was just sort of, you know what I mean? That, that value add is, is, is critical. And you might not need to go to get formal education for that, but I do want to underscore that, that sometimes that, that is a value add that would set you apart from other candidates if you do have that clinical experience. Great, thank you so much everybody for, I mean, just the great responses, sharing your career journey, taking time out of your, your work day to do this. I just wanna give like a virtual applause to you all and I hope everybody else in the audience is doing so as well.